Hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk in Search of Christianity, as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, due to technical trials and tribulations, Alice and Mark are both here, but on the other side of the camera. Actually, it's not the camera, it's my iPhone, because the camera done broke. <laughs> so... But we will survive. Hallelujah. We will prosper. We will be blessed. And nothing shall cause that to stop. Hallelujah. All right. As I said, we're, we're in. We're still looking. We're continuing. Last week we started on Jesus' statement, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And we're going to pick that up again in the second part of that, looking at they shall be satisfied. But before we do, I just want to ask, Father, that you would bless our time here. Lord God, that you, who watches over your word to perform it, whose word are words of eternal life, Lord God, that you would bless our time, bless this word, and Lord, just be in control of all that takes place here. Father, and I ask that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Can I hear an amen out there? Amen. Amen, okay. <laughs> all right. The Lord wants us to have peace. He, he himself is our peace, right? But that's virtually impossible when we're not content, when we're not satisfied. Dissatisfaction will rob you of your peace every time. See, and dissatisfaction is one of the most powerful forces on earth. Marriages and homes are broken because of it. Governments are overthrown because of it. Jobs are lost and lives are just wasted when people are dissatisfied and have no real hope. Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, back in the 1960s, I think one of their biggest hits, one of the biggest hits ever, was the song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And as a matter of fact, they just uh, did a reprise of that recently. I think they were here in the United States doing a concert and played that again. They still can't get any satisfaction. See, that, that British band was playing to the sentiments, sentiments of a, of a generation that was in rebellion and discontent with everything around them. They were looking in all the wrong places for satisfaction. Dissatisfaction, discontentment, is a motivator. It will motivate you to do things, but it will either motivate you to do good things or it will motivate you to do bad things. You know, it was Oswald Chambers, you know, Oswald Chambers, who wrote uh, My Utmost for His Highest, you know, back in the, he wrote that, in, I think, in 1927, in the early 20s, in any event. It's a book that's been read by, by millions and has blessed millions since it was first published. And I know one of the things, just a saying he said, and he talked about a magnificent obsession. To be obsessed means to be totally, totally focused on something. You can't take your mind off it. You can't take your eyes off it when you're, when you're obsessed with something. So you can have bad obsessions, or you can have that magnificent obsession. It's, it's a, an obsession will drive you to take action. Like I said, either good or bad, depending on what your obsession is. You know, um, back in the late 90s, there was a fellow, a Christian singer and songwriter named Scott Wesley Brown, who wrote a very beautiful song. I mean, a song that I really, really am blessed by, called More Like You, Jesus. I don't know if you're familiar with that. If you're not, go find it and listen to it. That expresses, I believe, a really, a, a godly dissatisfaction. Okay, do you believe you can have a godly dissatisfaction? Listen to the words, some of the words in that song. More like you, Jesus, more like you. Fill my heart with your desire to make me more like you. More like you, Jesus, more like you. 
touch my lips with holy fire and make me more like you. I think that's, that's a glorious desire. But it comes out of a dissatisfaction, in a sense, of where you are in Christ. Okay? You want to be more like Him. You're not satisfied. You're not content being where you are. Because we're not enough like Jesus. Right? And that's, what that, that's the sentiment that that song expresses. But that's a, there's a paradox here, you see. The paradox that is expressed is about our being less than completely Christ-like, right? So, but that's met with the promises of God. You know, it says, it says in Proverbs, like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a, from a far country, in Proverbs 25, 25. So God satisfies, you know, we're talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. If you're thirsty for righteousness, well, good news will, will, will satisfy that, right? Here's the good news. Here's the good news. Paul wrote to the Philippians and he said, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6 See, the work that he's doing, he's going to complete. And he goes on in Philippians in the second chapter to say, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, the Father's plan is not just to make me and you more like Jesus. His plan and his promise is to make me just like Jesus. Right. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. 1 John 3, 2. And then the great promise that Paul expresses in Romans eight twenty nine. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. More like Jesus? No. Just like Jesus. Dissatisfaction is a consequence. Something causes dissatisfaction, right? A spirit-led, logical approach to scriptures demands this observation. If hunger and thirst for righteousness results in satisfaction, the choice to hunger and thirst for other things or in place of righteousness must necessarily result in dissatisfaction. People don't understand it and don't believe it. I, it is hard today to find people who are satisfied, who are content. And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But think about this first. Uh, because everybody thinks... Money is the answer to everything. And yet, here is the Word of God. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this, He who loves money, or silver, will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. If you love money, if you love silver and gold, it's never going to satisfy you. That's the Word of God. What will satisfy you? The Lord God Almighty, a relationship with Him. That's the only thing. You see, mankind was made with a purpose. Man was formed to abide with God. That's what it says in Genesis 2. It's talking about that, right? God, man, God formed man to praise him. Isaiah 43, 21 says that perfectly clear. We were formed to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And God purposed for us to abide with him for all eternity. That's why it says in Habakkuk that he set eternity on our hearts. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.9 That's God's purpose. That's God's plan in our lives. That not only would, would we have this right relationship, that's righteousness, but we would have that relationship with Him hand in hand. What does He, you know, what does he desire of you? Right. Yes, to walk with Him for all eternity. That's God's plan. That's the thing that will satisfy. God will satisfy. The presence of God will satisfy you. Dissatisfaction, that's what I said a minute ago, is cultivated. It doesn't, have, it doesn't just pop up. It's cultivated, all right? Satan, the father of lies, who comes to steal, steal is the word I'm looking for, 
Satan who comes to kill, to steal, to destroy, has been working since the Garden of Eden to foment dissatisfaction. He wants you dissatisfied. He wants you discontent. And trust me, he has a lot of accomplices and little minions that are helping him with that purpose. Dr. Ernst Dichter was an Austrian-American psychologist and marketing expert. Uh, and he was known as the father of motivational research. Dichter is one of the single most important movers and shakers in the molding of American consumerism in advertising. Right? This goes back, he started in the 40s and went on. Because in the late 40s, he realized that the moral question posed by the across-the-board post-war corporate drive to persuade Americans to step up their consumption and live product-driven lives. So his, he made a fortune doing this, right? And he, he was an innovator. Nobody had done this before. And he went directly to major corporations and told them that he could show them psychologically how to get drive, make people buy their products, all right? He wrote a publication, or he had a publication, called Motivations. And in the, ninth, one of the April 1956 edition of this, I'm going to read this to you. So listen now, okay? This is what he wrote. We now are confronted with the problem of permitting the average American to feel moral, even when he's flirting, even when he's spending, even when he's not saving, even when he's taking two vacations a year and buying a second or third car. Remember, this is 1956, right? One of the basic pro problems of this prosperity, then, is to give people the sanction and justification to enjoy it and to demonstrate the hedonistic approach to life is a moral and not an immoral one. This permission given to the consumer to enjoy his life freely, the demonstration that he is right in surrounding himself with products that enrich his life and give him pleasure must be one of the central themes of every advertising display and sales promotion plan. All right? We talked about this, this, the morality of consumers back then to him was a problem because people weren't being driven to buy more, 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 get more, more, more. And as he said, business had to convince consumers that hedonism was moral. What, what, you know what hedonism? Hedonism is being devoted to the pursuit of pleasure and self-gratification. The desire for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. That's the definition of hedonism, right? And that's what he's saying that has to be cultivated in people. Well, the Apostle Paul dealt with that very same subject. But I guess from the other perspective, because Paul said, to, when he wrote to Timothy, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of self, Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All right, Second Timothy three, that's verses one to four. Lovers of lovers of uh, self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That is, and this is what he's saying. This is going to be the result. Well, that happens. This is going to be what happens in the perilous last days. And he's talking about the peril here, right? That's hedonism. It's self-gratification above all. On another occasion, Dr. Dichter pointed out that the public's shift away from what he called, this is what he called it, a Puritan complex, was enhancing the power of three major sales appeals. The desire for comfort, the desire for luxury, and the desire for prestige. That's pride. Loving self, right? This is an attitude quite in contrast to the teaching of God's Word. Because the Word says, if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. First Timothy 6 eight. We'll be satisfied if we have our basic needs met. Now i got to tell you something. A, a large flat screen television in every room of your house, including the bathroom and kitchen, is not a need. We've been convinced, basically, that it is. That's the consumerism, and that's what Victor said 
could be created in man, right? Much of the Western church is not only discontent today, it's, con I'm talking about the church now, right? It is cultivating that dissatisfaction in its members because it has learned well from the scriptures. It has learned that feeding the flesh will fill the pews, right? That's the nature of man that desires to get rather than the spiritual nature of man that has been trained to give. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I mean, isn't that what Jesus said in John 6? He said, he answered the crowds and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Because they were getting the natural stuff. Not because of the spiritual, not because he was the king of kings, not because he was the lord of lords, but because they were getting the bread. You can turn on, and I don't, I don't even like to do this, but I mean, you know, I get, I'm an early riser, I get up in the morning, and sometimes I'll turn on the television and flick through the stations, and I see preacher after preacher, evangelist after evangelist, telling people about how they can become rich. You know, just buy my, buy my Pentecostal holy water, and, you know, anoint your wallet, or, or do this, or do that. Or, and it's all about, you know, it says set your mind on the things above. But if you listen to so many of these preachers, so many of these teachers, so many of these so-called ministers, you will find all they are doing is getting people to focus on the world and the things of the world and trying to convince them that they that they God wants them to have it. And if they don't have it, then what are you doing? You're not content. They're going to be dissatisfied because you're being told you're supposed to have it. You know what you're supposed to have? Jesus said, deny yourself. Jesus said, die to yourself. You know what you need? You need that closer walk with him. Not long ago, pretty recently, I was invited to, to speak at a church, preach at a church in Central Florida, in Winter Park, Central Florida. And just before I got up to speak, the pastor's wife got up and she said, well, you know, before, before Alan comes up, we're going to pray for everybody's needs. And I stood up and I said, I'd like you to just hold off on that. I said, we'll do that afterwards. Because if, you, if you're going to pray for something, first of all, you need to pray in faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. You need to hear the word. And I said, the other thing is, my experience is that most Christians don't know what they need. That you think that you need a new house, a new job, a new this, a new that. You know what you need? Know the song? Just a closer walk with thee. What you need is just a closer walk with, with God. And all the rest takes care of it. You know, I, I said the, the Beatitudes, this is the teaching. All the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is the commentary. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Because Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the rest will be added unto you. God knows. Before you can think, before you can ask, he knows exactly what you need. And the promise is, back to Philippians again, that he will meet, he will supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You don't have to convince God to love you. You don't have to convince God to take care of your needs. All you have to do is walk hand in hand with him. Focus on him. Everything else takes care of itself. That's why so many Christians are dissatisfied, malcontent, because you're so focused on the world and the things of the world. Those people who were following Jesus because they ate from the loaves and got filled, those are the very same ones, or so many of them, in that sixth chapter of John. Go read John 6, from verses 60 to 66. John 6, 6, 6. Is that a coincidence? And it says, many of those who were his disciples walked away from him. You know why? Because his word was too difficult. We need, we need to have difficult words. As iron sharpens iron, that's grating. You know, the words of Jesus Christ, they're going to grate against your flesh. But they're going to sharpen your spirit. That should be our great desire, is that closer walk with Jesus. See, dissatisfaction in our lives has to be dealt with. It's got to be dealt with. You know, problems don't take care of themselves. you got to... You know, things don't get better by themselves. 
If you believe that, then you believe in evolution, uh, really. But the simple fact of the matter is that things left to themselves, when they're not working right, they just get worse and worse and worse. If you're having a problem, deal with it. If you're dissatisfied, you've got to deal with it. But you got choices. You know, choose you this day whom you will serve. You have choices. You always have choices. So I mean, choose from one of the two below that I'm going to give you, right? You can nurture and grow in your discontentment by disobeying God's word, which says, do all things without grumbling or disputing, Philippians 2.14. So you can grumble and mumble and groan and complain. And what do you think is going to happen? You're feeding your dissatisfaction. You're feeding your discontentment. You are feeding your flesh in a p opposition to your spirit. That's your first choice. The second choice is you can do it right. Do what is right. What's, you can do what's righteous. And obey the will of God. What's the will of God? I've had so many people come. I want to know the will of God. That's the easiest thing in the world to tell you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18. The Apostle Paul wrote, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do you want to conquer dissatisfaction? Do you want to conquer discontentment? Start giving thanks in it. Whatever's going on in your life, give thanks. Not, not after you see. Don't wait till you see an answer from God. Because that's not faith. Start praising Him and thanking Him now. Remember what I said? He has formed the people to declare His praise. What you believe will determine the choice that you make. And what you choose will determine your life. That's a simple fact. But you've got to choose what you're going to do. You know, Joshua in the wilderness said that to the people. Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he said, but as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. A lot of people, and I, I know we've talked about this, we've taught about it. The Red Sea is one of the greatest events in the history of the people of God. When God sent Moses into the land of Egypt to take the people out of bondage and set them free. And God, the Spirit of God, led those people to the Red Sea. And when they got there and saw what to them appeared to be an impassable, impossible barrier to the promise. They couldn't see an answer. They couldn't see how that could possibly come to pass. How they were going to escape Pharaoh when they can't, they're at the Red Sea and they hear the chariots, the army of Pharaoh come on. So they mumbled and grumbled and complained. They were dissatisfied with where they were. They started to say, Why didn't they say to Moses, Why did you take us out of Egypt? We were better off in Egypt. We were better off back in the world. But God, in his grace and mercy, delivered them, parted the sea. And they marched through the sea, the parted sea, on dry land. And when they got to the other side, the Pharaoh and his army tried to follow, and they were swallowed up and destroyed. When they got to the other side, they sang, and they danced, and they had a jubilee, and they praised the Lord. You know what God calls that? Well, I don't know. What do you call that? I'm going to tell you what God calls it. Rebellion. If you don't believe me, go read Psalm 106 and see what the Lord says about that Red Sea experience. Because they were grumbling and complaining. You see, they didn't act in faith. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. They had to see the waters part before they would step out. They had to see the answer before they would begin to respond to God's word. God wants you to start praising him in the midst of the situation. You know, your situation is not supposed to be in control of you. Is that a simple truth? The Spirit of God is supposed to be in control of you. The Word of God is supposed to direct you. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Not your situation, not the conditions that you are experiencing. You need to start praising God and giving Him thanks because He has you in the palm of His hand. Do you believe His promises or don't you? Okay. My desire in my own life is that I would imitate the Apostle Paul just as he imitated Christ. That's what he said we should do in 1 Corinthians 11, right? Imitate him as he imitated Christ. And he said, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, 
and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Can we make that statement? Can we make it out of, out of the abundance of our heart? That regardless of what's going on in our lives, we will praise him. Where, whatever, wherever, what, nothing's going on in your life that, that is taking God by surprise. Nothing is going on in your life that God didn't let go on in your life. That's a fact. He is in control, and He has purpose. And part of the purpose is that in the midst of a world that is filled with dissatisfaction, in the midst of a world that is filled with discontentment, in the midst of a world that has, doesn't even know what peace is, in the midst of a world like that, we would stand in that perfect peace, knowing that every need that we have is taken care of, that whatever situation we find ourselves in, we are content that we might be that light that shines into the world, that we would be that salt of the earth that draws men to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to learn to do this. You know, and the simple fact is, if you've, been, if you've been saved for any time, you should know this. The question becomes, do we do it? It's one thing to know it, because it says, you know, if you're just a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, you're ineffectual. Okay? We have to do the Word of God. And we've got to proclaim it. It says, believe, you, know, by, you believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. That results in salvation. James said, you know, you say you have faith? Show me. Faith without works is dead being by itself. If you say you have faith, but it doesn't result in causing action in your life, then you're lying to yourself. And the action that it should lead to is an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. Let me say it one more time. Give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Regardless of what's going on in your life, start giving thanks. Start praising Him. And trust, you know, and you, you know what? You will be satisfied. You will be satisfied. Regardless of what God chooses to do, you will have perfect peace, a peace that passes understanding, and you will be satisfied, because that is God's desire. So, Father, we just praise you. We praise you and thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that if you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, to go in our place to that cross, what good thing would you withhold? Lord, help us to have that faith, that trust in your love, and Lord, you've shown us so many times in so many ways, in so many places, Lord. Lord, there are so many testimonies of, of your love. Lord, we, just, we thank you that we're not dependent on the world and the things of the world to satisfy us. That we will not be deceived by the riches of the world. That chokes the... That, because that belief, that this believing in the deceitfulness of riches will choke the word in our lives. So, Father, we just praise you and thank you for your eternal word, for your words of eternal life. Hallelujah. Well, until next time, when maybe we'll have a camera back, and maybe we won't, but we'll be back, whatever the situation is, because God desires it. God bless you and goodbye until next time. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners